You're listening to Cotton Tales Podcast, part of the Silicon Valley Black Project, which produced the documentary film A Place at the Table about the black pioneers of Silicon Valley. A Place at the Table can be viewed for rent on Vimeo.com on demand backslash A Place at the Table stem. Through Cotton Tales podcast, the Silicon Valley Black Project will continue to recognize the contributions made by African Americans. We will be featuring African American professionals, technologists in the fields of engineering, administration, and entrepreneurial pursuits from the past and present. Today, we're talking with June Fleming, former city manager of Palo Alto, California, the first African-American woman to become a city manager in the state of California. Mrs. Flemings was responsible for such improvements in Palo Alto as the extension of Sand Hill Road into the city of Palo Alto, universal internet services throughout the city, and many city-related improvements under the, her administration. Speak up. We just did what we thought was the right thing to do and tried to open doors. Um, so I think, yeah, it's not, it's not documented as a contribution by a group probably anywhere. You've got a lot of little pieces you can pull together. Mm-hmm. Getting the job done, but we weren't busy uh, making, a, a publicizing ourselves or having a, a, a publicist that would give people information about us. I mean, they know their work was good because they're uh, bright people and it was interesting uh, situations that they were in, but they don't think of it as something super special. You know, they just, that was their job. We'll see what kind of contribution I can make to what you do. (laughs) Okay. Tell me then, uh, tell me a little bit about June. I I understand that you weren't born in California. I moved to California with my husband, uh, because he accepted a job in California. My husband worked at Lockheed in a stressful position. He was in charge of nuclear submarines and missiles. I did not come with him the first year because I was working at a predominantly black college in Little Rock. And we were in the midst of reaccreditation, and I, I just didn't see how I could leave them at that time. So when he got to Lockheed, Lockheed is in Sunnyvale, California. He just felt he had to give his soul to it and succeed. Uh, they used to say his staff is the United Nations of Lockheed. He said, I'm not going to leave my people behind, not not going to do it. They're going to come with me and we're going to do a wonderful job. And he he was good. I had a daughter who was a special needs person. So he looked around at the school systems and picked Palo Alto, not knowing the housing was not readily available for blacks there. But he met a lady named Elsa Alsberg who had formed an organization they called it the Fair Play Council. But someone said, talk to her, and she may be able to help you. And she did. She helped her find housing in Palo Alto. That's how we came to live in Palo Alto. Soon learned, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the Black representation in Palo Alto was extremely low, very few. But, you know, they didn't stop us. We just moved on in. And our plan was that I wasn't going to work. You know how far that went. After two weeks, <laughs> I was going crazy in the house. I launched out to try to find a job and someone to take care of our daughter. And I just didn't give up till I found something. I had my work experience in working in libraries up until then. I left as a director and head of the department at the college where I worked, Philander Smith and Little Rock. But I I really wanted to start over. I I wasn't quite sure I was in the right profession. I just felt libraries needed to be 
revitalized in many ways. And organizational labor was one of them. So I was gonna start at the bottom and work my way up. That was hard, hard finding a job, hard finding a job in Palo Alto. I went to Stanford and tried to talk to people they weren't interested. Uh, they told me I was overqualified for an entry level job and not sufficiently qualified for administrative job. So I just plugged along, saw a few ads for different things. And the guy who had uh, insurance said, there's an opening for a director of libraries in Palo Alto. I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> you look at that city government, there are no blacks and no women. And at that time, believe it or not, even, not even younger administrators. But my mother-in-law was visiting us and she really pushed me. She said, Jimmy, you need to do this. We don't have role models and us old folks uh, are not able to do this. So I applied, I applied for the director job and surprisingly I got it. So that got me started in city government. And I just loved it. I was the first black and the first woman in management in Palo Alto. At the time that I came, they decided to take a different organizational approach and did not allow the library to stand alone as a department. They formed what they called a Department of Social and Community Services. The person who had been the director of libraries, they made him head of that department. I became a division head under that administrator. That was the highest level in management blacks had ever had, never a woman and never a person. Then I was the youngest also. I began to really just like city government and decided I wanted to leave the library and do something else. So I went through various job changes in the, in the city. We had a very progressive manager. He said, uh, if you want to move, I'll move you. What do you want to do? Just tell me what you want to do. Uh, his name was George Seifel. And I talked to him. He gave me different opportunities. He really did. He said, if you don't want to continue to do library work, he said, I don't think your educational background is going to be helpful to you when you're going up against a tough field of people. At the same time, he was interested in just generally providing professional development for the staff. And he got the council to approve um, a sabbatical leave program, which was unheard of in the city government. My husband has all was, he's deceased now, pushed me forward and kept saying, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And he said, why don't you apply for the Stanford Executive Training Program? I said, are you kidding? <laughs> Number one, we couldn't afford it. He said, well, they have grants and fellowships. And he actually filled out the application. I didn't get the time to fill out the application. This, this and I mentioned it. This uh, is your husband filling out the applica application for you? Uh -huh. OK. So I told George Seifel about it. He said, well, you try it. He said, if you get it, if they admit you, I'll submit your name to the council as the first recipient of this uh, sabbatical leave program. Because you, if you get what you're applying for, you have a fellowship, you'll be a fellow. That will pay for your tuition. And the city will pay you while you're there. So that's what I did. I applied. I got the fellowship. George took the recommendation to the council and they approved it. So when I finished that Stanford Executive Training Program, George said, now what, what are you gonna do? Uh, you're not gonna be satisfied going back to the library. And I said, I, I really don't know, I'll be honest with you. I just know I'm now interested in government and I think I can help libraries and everybody else. But I want you to be very clear about one thing. I'm not ever going to take any job anywhere because I'm black. I want to be in the pool. I don't want to be excluded because I'm black. But once I'm in the pool, 
I'll stand on my own. And if you use my race in any way to get that job for me, I will not take it. And he said, good enough. So he offered me a job as special assistant to the city manager. And I took it. And he said, where would you like to work? I said, I, I would really like to go to human resources because I need to understand government better if I'm going to go further. And I said, that's a danger in my mind because the director of that department is a mom. And he said, he won't give you a problem. I said, no, but I'll give him a problem. <laughs> And I'm not going to take it. I'm not, I'm not going to take it. I won't be there on my words. And I may appear as a statistic in your affirmative action program, but that's the end of it. And he said, the affirmative action program is in a sad state right now. I said, I'll fix it for you, but I'll do it from HR as a special assistant to the city manager. That got me started. So what, uh, about what... Uh, what was the uh, years that we're talking about here? What, you know, what? I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> well, well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> At my age, I don't remember the years. Um, yeah. I stayed working with the city as uh, director of that Department of Community Services that I told you about. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And... Uh, I think I have it was doing well. We did well. We did well. But one city manager came there named William Zaynor. He came from Fremont. And uh, we went through Prop 13, remember? And we cut all the so many positions. And they had an assistant city manager position and they cut it. And Mr. Zaynor said to them he would not take the job if they did not restore that position. And he posted it, and I didn't apply for it. And he stopped me in the hall, and he said, why didn't you apply for that job? I said, well, because, quite honestly, I think you know who you want in that position. You've been working with that person, and that's their aspiration. And he said, you don't run this city. I said, I know I don't, but I could. And he said, I'm the boss. I said, well, look. We're wasting our time because the position is not posted any longer. He said, I'm going to repost it for a week, and you do what you think is best. He reposted it, and I applied, and he hired me, and that was the beginning. I worked as assistant city manager, and he was a wonderful mentor. He taught me more than any school ever could. He was true to his word. He said, if you're the assistant, you run this city. And I mean run it. Because that's not what I am going to do. He said, I am visionary. I'm going to do the long range planning and you are going to run this city and I will stand behind you. And he did. He said, if you ever need any help, you come to me and I'll talk it through with you. But it's all, and he told the council. And he said, don't treat her any other way. In fact, the interesting thing is one night uh, we had a very heated finance committee meeting and I did the budget. I mean, Bill stayed out of it totally. He said, she knows what she's doing. I support her. I understand where she is. And, you know, some of them got kind of feisty with me that night. He heard about it. The next morning at work, he said, I don't like what happened last night. And the council's going to hear from me. Uh -huh. And I said, well, Bill, I didn't take it that way. I, I don't think. He said, oh, yeah, that, that was, it was because you were there and you're not the manager. And uh, he called He called the person on the phone, the council member, and he said, you will not treat it that way. You will not. A few people know he did that. After that, I never had another problem. Never. And we went through some rough times. We so they, they found out they couldn't bully you. And they also yeah. found out that your boss was fully behind you. So, you know what's interesting, though, uh, uh, June? You've mentioned the, that this man mentored you. Um, mm -hmm. And that was that's a piece of our American history that we don't hear about. 
or who were willing to take the risk to put us in strategic positions and then follow through by giving us the mentoring that we need, the information, the guidance that we needed to be successful against all odds. Well, you know, I am grateful to in faith. And Bill was in the position of city manager. So Bill was committed. I mean, he was committed to equality. Uh, he had a proven track record. And my attitude was, if I can get some things done here differently, I don't care whether they admit it or not, we're going to make a difference. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, I don't care who knows it or doesn't know it. I knew that we needed to integrate the staff. Uh, and I just did those things. I, and they were glad to let me do it because I took it, the heat off of them. You know, while I was there, they had that um, period of time when East Powell also. You're familiar with East Powell? Very much so, yes. Okay. Remember, they were declared the murder capital of the world. I told the council, I said, let me tell you, I am not going to sit here and see that happen. And we do nothing about it. And I said, you will not survive politically either if you don't do something about it. They were glad for me to take the lead in it. And I said, that is not my role. This is your role. You've got to make the laws and I'll implement them. Uh, and I said, I'm not looking for any credit. I'll bring every change to you that I need to have made. You need to approve it. They don't need to see it as my plan. I do not care. That city can't survive by itself. They need help. You've got two cities sitting here, Palo Alto and Menlo Park, right. both with money, both with good police staffs. And you think because 101 separates the two of you, you're not going to feel it? You're crazy. And they said, you bring to us what you want us to do and we'll support you. I said, and don't say it's your city manager because I need, I need you out there. You're the politician. You're going to have to go to Sacramento when it's needed. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to support me with the governor. I'm going to tell him and all the rest of them that it won't stop here. It won't stop here. So they did. They let me work on it. We formed a uh, a red team mm -hmm. of police. I told the chief, I said, this team has to work. It has to work so well that Menlo Park will be willing to join us in it. And it's got to work so well that they get no extra pay for doing it. And it's got to work so well that they are all volunteers because it can't be seen as that black city manager forced that police department to do that. And he said, you got it. And that's what we did. Mm -hmm. We found a red team. We would go over to East Palo Alto and meet with them. When they needed help, they called us and we went. When the communities really got bad, I knew we had a good drug team. I said, send them over there. Send them over there. If you have a problem with them, send them to my office. We helped them turn that police department around. But I, I knew it couldn't last forever. I told the People in East Palo Alto, I said, you, you're going to have to, you know, take this as an opportunity where you're going to get some peace and quiet, but you're going to pull your government together. Mm -hmm. Anything I can do to help you, I will. If you get rebuked here in Palo Alto, I'll step in and do what I can. But Kathy, it was hard getting people who just wanted to ignore it to do the things that they should do. I mean, Stanford had a big game and I said here's a good opportunity to get some East Palo Alto people to come over to the game and people in East Palo Alto said we're not going to let them come across that bridge because they ignore us I said well suppose you had your kids going to the game would you feel better and they said yes so I called over there and one of the prominent ex-49ers was there Lynn uh, Swan and I said how dare you ignore East Palo Alto. You made no effort. You didn't reach out to them. You didn't do anything. He said, well, they're threatening to stop the traffic at the bridge. I said, and they can do it. 
He said, well, I want you to help me. I said, so you call me at my house on a Saturday <laughs> to stop a blockade that you could have prevented if you had reached out to help your brothers. Those are your brothers and sisters over there. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I don't, I don't quite see it that way. I said, I don't care how you see it. I am not putting my foot on that bridge to do anything. It's up to you. I said, if you're willing to open up let some of them in, include them in some of your efforts, then I will call their mayor. Other than that, he said, well, I'll call your mayor. I said, you go right ahead and call, but I'm not going to listen to you. But don't forget Tiger Woods was there at that time. That's and I tried to get him to start a golf group without Black youth. And I said, to make it easier, we can start off with the black youth in Palo Alto, but eventually I want East Palo Alto involved. You know what he told me? He said, I'm not black. I said, you're the poorest kind of black because you don't know you're black. And he said, well, why are you doing it? I said, the question is not why I'm doing it. The question is, will you help us? And he wouldn't do it. Not at all. Like, mm -mm, not at all. So, you know, you have to do a lot of stuff behind the scenes. And I didn't care, Kathy, because I wasn't doing it for me. I go home every night. <laughs> I was totally satisfied, but my race was not. I was I was so honored when I left uh, East Palo Alto City. We're losing a friend and we're not going to replace. So they declared East Palo Alto Day, I said. Oh. I'm, I'm doing well. But I loved Palo Alto. Palo Alto did a lot of good. A lot of good things, you know. We, I give the council complete credit. They never, they never turned me down. They never said no. I wrote the affirmative action program for the city. It was the first beginning. It still needed to be improved, but they, they committed to that and they did it. And I told them, I said, you have opportunities to do things that other cities don't. We have a homeless problem, and I said you can't ignore it. And you know, like I know, most of them are black, right? So I said, I have an idea. I want to start a summer homeless work program because every summer you have a summer hire program and you bring in all these rich kids and give them jobs during the summer and you, you ignore this other part of the population you're responsible for. And they said, we'll commit the same dollars to your homeless summer program if you can make it work, that we do to our regular summer program. And we started the first homeless summer work program. I talked to the staff about it, and I said, they're not going to be pleasant to work with. Their work habits are going to be different. And you know what I got? Well, we'll do it, but we are not trained. You know, we don't, uh, you know, we don't know how to handle it. I said, well, I thought that's what you said. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to start an academy, a leadership training academy. And I'm going to train you. I'm not going to train you, but your department heads are going to see. So we started a leadership training academy for managers. I said, you know, society is changing. Mm -hmm. A lot of those skills you need, you didn't get in school. I put it in the budget. The council supported it. The academy went well. The staff was happy. We started unique programs we hadn't had before. If they needed skills, we put it in the academy program and they got to get it. They ended up being so proud of that summer. <laughs> they were out recruiting people <laughs> at night to come and work. And it worked well. And the homeless people worked. It wasn't an answer to anything, but it was a beginning. Because we did things like that, Paul Walter got a little bit of acknowledgement for it. I got the the Department of Social and Community Services is a grant writer, and she wrote a grant for um, continuing the program and embellishing it and training people. It wasn't costing the city anything. But we did find out about other grants that were available, and we found out that the government had grants for facilities that were veteran facilities that weren't at capacity. And there was one in Menlo Park. And we got a housing program going again, too. We just, we just have to. Well, and uh, the other thing is, I think, not only do you have to put effort, but you have to recognize that these people exist. So many times, yes. the 
larger population or the, the status quo. And because they don't look, what they don't see is that they are ignoring people who are possibly teachers, who mm-hmm. could be leaders, who could be store clerks. There's all kinds of things these people are capable of doing. If you're not the right color, if you're not wearing the right clothes, it just blows my you gotta mind. you got to act a certain way. you got to look a certain way. That was a young Caucasian kid had a mental problem. He really had the potential. He could be very bright, but he would worry the council. Had he come and he'd just tell him, you know, you don't. he was down at the washeteria, the laundromat. He was just giving the police trouble. I came by and he knew me. And I, I said, go ahead and sit down with me and tell me what is wrong. And I sat on the curb with him. And I said, you're not gonna get anywhere if you don't get some treatment. If we take you to the VA, he said, police don't do that. I said, well, this police department does and we will help you. Uh, and they did, and they watched him, and they said, we were so frightened for you sitting on that curb. I said, if I can't sit on the curb, nobody can sit on the curb. <laughs> but he came to the council after he got out, and he said, uh, I came here and talked to you. You wouldn't do anything. Only Jim would help me. And, uh, you know, the mayor said, you know, he's right. We need to start with where we find them. I said, well, we usually find them on the street and it's the police who find them. And he said, well, we need to sit down with the chief. I said, I've been telling you that. But you know, they would pick up. They would pick up on things I would say to them. Mm -hmm. And he got a a little special unit organized in the police department, council funded it. And when we would run into them on the street and they'd cause trouble, they knew how to handle them. They talked to them. Uh, and if they didn't like what they said, they'd come straight to my office and said, we go into June. And they said, well, you can't just walk in her office. I said, yes, we can. <laughs> she lets us in. And I thought that was key, you know? She mm-hmm. lets us in. I said, that's what you all got to do. You got to let them in. Right. You gotta what that. else, what other job does uh, city officials have other than to listen to the people who live in the city they're trying to govern? Right. Well... I loved it. I loved it. It was hard work. I loved it. I enjoyed it. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't all that. It was, you know, Stanford was there. They're the, oh, they are difficult to deal with. You have no idea how difficult they are. Well, I, I have I have a pretty good idea just by the way they designed the streets. And <laughs> Well, I don't know. I don't know how it is now. I, I always said I'd never go back. And I, I intend not to go back. Yeah. But before I left, 280, when you would take Sand Hill Road off, you would end up in the shopping center. It didn't cut through to El Camino. And it had been that way for ages. And they said, we just, we cannot come to agreement. And I said, you won't come to agreement because you don't, you don't want to. I said, you want to keep traffic out of Palo Alto, but you want the shopping center to thrive because that's where they get their sales tax. And that's where our revenue comes from. They had worked on that for years. The council decided one year when they did the comprehensive plan, they were going to make one last effort. And they worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. They finally got to a final impasse and said, we give up. I said, don't give up. Well, of course, you know, the responsibility was in the planning department. So a few of the council members said, I understand they're going to have one last meeting because we can't agree with the proposals that they're bringing to push uh, Sand Hill Road through to El Camino. I said, let me go to the meeting. I went to the meeting. And they were carrying on as they usually do. All the planners were there and all the finance people were there. I can't remember who was the president of Stanford then, but his representative was not there that day. And I asked why. And they said, well, said he's overseas and he's left uh, Condoleezza Rice in charge and she didn't have it on her schedule, so she's not coming. I said, okay, have the meeting. I sat there. 
And it hit me at that meeting while they were doing all that gibberish, why they wanted it the way they did. And I stood up and I said, I'm taking my staff home and I'm closing this meeting. I know what you're trying to do. I know why you want sex to be zoned that way. You are having trouble at the hospital and you don't have enough space and you want that zoning so you can move your staff into that old building and you will never ever listen to us. But I am going to the council meeting Monday night and I'm gonna tell them we can't reconcile, we cannot. So they called me the next day and said, well, Stanford has a proposal for you. I said, what is it? And they said, they want Condoleezza to come over and meet with you before you go to the council Monday night. I said, well, she's coming here. I'm not going there because we have what you want. She wouldn't come. She said, I'm not going over there and talk to her. I've heard about her. She's not going to change her mind. I'm not going to waste my time. The mayor came and said, June, it's, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I'm going to report to you that we have met an impasse with Stanford. And so forget Sand Hill Road. It will never go through. And he said, well, you know, Gerhardt's not here. I said, I know, but he left someone to act and she wouldn't meet with me. And they said, really? I said, yeah. They said, okay, we're ready. Well, on Friday, they said their lead negotiator to me and said, what do you want in exchange? And I told him, this is what we have to have. If we don't have it, I am going to recommend to the council that they close the project. You can get through to El Camino, can't you? Yes, you can. You, <laughs> yes, you can. That's because of what I did. Uh -huh. And nobody knows, and I've never shared this story with anyone before. But that's why it's through. Mm -hmm. I said, now the council needs to get out there and take the lead and support it. When they had the groundbreaking for opening it up, the mayor said, you're coming. I just said, no, it's not my role. You didn't go? Not my role. Oh. It's your role. You take it and you fly. I've laid the groundwork. I'm finished with it. I'm on to something else. Now, see, there you go. Now, see, June, that is why I have all this work to do. <laughs> yes, absolutely. 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 This, is all, this is what I'm talking about. You just. But I know Stanford, see. Yeah. David Weber was a head librarian there. And I applied for a job. And he he said, No, you're not you're not really qualified for what we have, you're old qualified. But I said, okay, and I left. Mm -hmm. About five or six years later, David retired. David wrote me a personal letter and said, I want you to apply for my job and I'll see that you get it. I said, David, are you out of your mind? He said, come over and talk to me. I went over out of courtesy. I went over when I got in his office, he said, you didn't have any trouble finding me with all this construction. How did you get here so easily? I said, because you've forgotten that I walked through that construction to come and ask you for a job and you turned me down. <laughs> I'm turning you down today. I don't want your job. I want to do what I'm doing. He said, do you know what you're turning down? Your kids could go to Stanford, Stanford. I said, I've gotten all I need from Stanford. I got, you know, I went through the executive program. That's all I needed. Paid for it with a fellowship. Mm -hmm. I said, Stanford's going to have to wake up one day, but I'm not going to be a part of your awakening. I said, you realize I came here and you sent me home saying, no, today I leave in a better place than you are. Good for you. Good mm -hmm. for you. That's the, there's that belief that the uh, people in charge, it's not always about, about race, because they think they are the chosen few. Yes. And they also believe that we want to be them. And that's yes. not what we're asking. No. no we no. don't want to be you. We want to be able to help you, mm -hmm. you know, support you. Right. But we also know that if we can get into these positions, if we can get at the table, we will bring to you the issues that you overlook 
because I don't of, understand. And don't understand. Spoken. I am outspoken. And yeah. I thought that was going to be a problem here in this city when I moved here because this is the deep south. This is a rural community mill town. Like, mm. had a little money because they had the camp family which owned the mill. And, but I told them when I came here, I said, listen, I'm going to do what I want, how I want, and you're not going to stop me. I have. I have. I've done, I've done what, I've enjoyed it here. One night, this council exploded because they had a riff of city manager went upstairs and, <laughs> and quit. And he left in two weeks. They put out an ad for an interim. And my husband said, why don't you just help him out? I said, well, I don't want anything that's given to me. I don't want to really work but I don't mind helping. So I applied for the interim city manager until they could find somebody. I did not tell them until they chose me because this is, this is, I mean, this is the South. Yes. They've never had a black anything here. <clears throat> but when they saw my resume, they pretty well couldn't, you know, say no. So I told them, I said, I, I do not want to be paid. This is, I believe in volunteerism. I came from a city where we lived and breathed it, and we got lots done with volunteers, things you will never do. This is my gift to you. <laughs> I have nothing but time. <laughs> I've given up. I've said at this age, I've given up all of my community. I gave up my last community position here. I'm not running around the meetings anymore. I'm too old for that. Yeah. Uh, I think I've achieved more than I ever dreamed I would achieve here. I've worked with the community college and I, oh, that was, oh, what an experience. Uh, when the governor gave me his philanthropy award, I said, I'm going home and sit down. I've done enough. <laughs> <laughs> but I have the community college here, I think for, for our kids is a, is a answer. That they need to pursue. Yes. Um, but I loved Palo Alto. Palo Alto did a lot of good, a lot of good things. You know, we, Palo Alto has so much talent and skill in that community because it attracts people that are connected with the big companies in Stanford. And if they miss a little piece, we'll find it. Uh, in the city, and uh, and we'll say, you know, you're just doing so well. We had this idea because of you, and they'll support it. Now, when cable TV was a twinkle in people's eyes, I said to the council, I said, you know, you're never going to be satisfied with any cable company because that's how you are. When you fuss about the boxes and what color they are and the size, it, it's not going to work. It's not going to work here. I mean, I can. You're not going to get a response from. Pacific Bell, uh, whoever it is. Mm -hmm. I said, why don't we do it ourselves? Not the city, but why don't you let the citizens do it? All you had to do is plant a seed with them. You know, they like to be hurt. They got with some of the activists and they built cable co-op run by the citizens. When they complain, they think, you know, what a great idea. Well, I was keeping the headaches out, out of my desk. When they would come to me and complain, I say you have to go to Cape Co-op. Cable Co-op is recognized by the council. They are running the cable system, and they are doing a fantastic job. That didn't cost taxpayers a penny. Do they still have Cable Co-op? Yes. yes. Good. So that was yes. another June Fleming idea. But you can't tell them it's your idea. You <laughs> no, I... you know, you know. But Cable Co-op did a wonderful job. They had their own programming, their own channels. Some of the activists got them off of some of the stuff that they were driving us crazy about because they were so dedicated to cable co-op. And it worked. It's just, it's wonderful. But recycling got started in Palo Alto because I had in the library a young man who was a conscientious observer. And I helped him get his status settled with the city. And he said, I want to start a recycling program. I said, they don't even know what you're talking about, Doug. And he said, would you really let me do it? I said, well, go to it. So he's, he really started recycling as a project 
to justify his being classified as a conscientious objector. And Paolo had, I'm sure they still do, have the greatest recycling program there is. What, what was his name? Doug McDavid. Doug went on to do great things, but he he got started with a little recycling program. And here's, a, here's another thing. They built the main library, bought a lot of land way back, I don't know even when. They did not use it all. So it was just sitting there mm -hmm. waiting to expand the library. So I said, you know, we need to use that. Why don't the council use it? And they said, well, one day we're going to use it for the library. I said, well, that's true. You do need to grow. And they have now. They have. But at that time, it was just sitting there. So I talked to the staff. I asked staff members, said, well, I've got an idea. I said, what's the idea? They said, well, you're going to laugh. I said, well, I mean, that's a good thing. We started a garden, a community garden there. That when they try to close that community garden, the council chambers <laughs> are filled. But let me tell you, people love it. They support it. They don't. It's just city land. They don't have to pay for it. It's nothing off the tax rolls. They grow flowers. They grow vegetables. They provide, you know, things for events. Uh, they give food to the homeless. It all came from just an idea a staff member had. But, they, you know, you just have to give people a chance. Oh, really, it sounds like, June, not only do you are you innovative, but you're willing to leave space for those who would like to innovate as well. In other words, you're oh, not yeah. going to swelch a new idea. Let me tell you, you can't, you, nobody knows everything. But I think things I've done, I've done because I've had great people to work with, just great people. And I have great faith, and I will not give up if I think it's right. But it's really the people I've associated with. They, I just can't begin to name the people who have come to me and said, have you ever thought about it? And I'll say, no, but let's think about it. Well, there's and the key. Sometimes, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. You know. Well, the key but, factor is that you said, well, let's think about it. Yeah. I mean... People gave me a chance to do things I wanted to do, so why shouldn't I give other people a chance to do things they want to do? And it just happens that most of them are minorities because we're the ones that they don't let in to share our ideas. They close their doors. So I had a chance to reverse it. Mm -hmm. We built a park in downtown Palo Alto, Johnson, Edith Johnson Park. The people downtown were angry. The council said, June, you got to do something. They're angry. They need a park. We have a city block, but that's, you know, they don't think that's big enough. That won't work. So just, you know, they just tell me, just, okay. So I sat down with the people in the recreation department, and we thought about it. And we said, well, you know, technically, the sidewalk belongs to the city, right? That's our land. So we don't need to think just the boundaries of the defined lots that make up that square city block. We need to include in our thinking the sidewalks and you can get more space and do more things. Don't try to hide it, just lay it out there. They designed a wonderful park, a wonderful park. Everybody loves Edith Johnson Park, at least at that time they did. My secretary comes in and she says, June, guess who's on the park? I said, who? Steve Jobs. I said, well, what does he want? She said, he wants to talk to you about Johnson Park. I said, well, tell him if he wants to come down here and talk to me, he can come down here. So he made, he did, he made an appointment. He came in and he said, do you know where I live? I said, of course I know where you live. Why'd you ask me that? I know where you live. He said, well, I'm near, neighborhood parks are very popular, as you can tell when you drive around Palo Alto. Right. He said, I want that park to look like East Johnson Park. I said, you do? He said, yes. My kids would love it. I, and I think all the kids in the neighborhood would love it. I said, well, it's not in my plan to do anything. Uh, that park was recently rehabbed. And he said, I, I don't care. I'll pay for it. I mean, to see jobs, that was nothing. You know. Yeah, nothing. He said, you just do it. I said, no, 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 no. That's not how we do business here. He said, what are you talking about? I said, that is a neighborhood park. 
not a Steve Jobs part. So we can't convert that into what's at Johnson Park unless the neighbors agree. So we'll have a meeting. Oh no, he said, I'm gonna pay for it. I'll put it in like I want it. I said, oh my dead body you will. He said, do you know who you told to? I said, do you know who you told him? You may run your piece, but I run my piece. And I am not gonna do it. I'm not gonna go to the council and tell them that you're gonna give me money and I'm gonna turn that park into Edith Johnson Park. I'm not gonna do it. He said, well, I'll just go talk to the council members. I said, go right ahead. Two days later, Mara, my secretary said, the mayor's on the phone. He just got through talking to Steve Jobs. I said, put him on the phone. Mayor said, too. Do you know what you did to Steve Jobs? I said, I told him I was not going to build a park there for him. I told him we have neighborhood parks that this council support. And I knew you'd support me. I know you see that. I know you're not going to cave in. I'm just fixing them up. I said, no, you're not going to cave in to him because he's one person with money. He said, I did. I told him, thank you, but you got to convince the city manager. You can't convince her. We'll just keep the park like it is. But you see, they do that. They come in and give you money and decide what you need. He wasn't going to decide for me what the city that I loved and cared for needed. His neighbors were going to help, and he didn't. He wasn't willing to do that. I, he said, I don't think anybody has ever told him no. I said, well, it's the first for everything. <laughs> it is. <laughs> People say, how did you have the courage? I said, it did not take courage. No. It took common sense. He's going to build a park for his kids in a neighborhood where they pay all pay taxes. No, it didn't work. We were the first city on the internet. Al Gore somehow picked us. He came there one night and asked about it. The mayor said, June. I said, don't call June. We have a library director. She knows what she's doing. Call her. I'll be behind her. Uh, so we launched the internet right there in Palo Alto. Mm. Uh, so the whole city is has uh, internet capabilities then. Yes. And then COVID hit and children uh, had to be at home studying. Here's the whole city is covered by the internet. There was no problem getting right. that information to them. Now the infrastructure has changed. We don't need to have the same kind of work done, but we do right. need. They don't have a, what's the big P word? Plan. They have no plan. <laughs> yes. They have no plan. A good gracious thing. But, you know, I enjoyed it. I got them up, got them. Finances in good shape, changed the city. All they had to do was maintain it. They just... So what, what made you leave? Uh, why did you leave California? I had accomplished the things I wanted to do. One of the things I wanted to do was to completely revamp the budget system. And I had done that. I had brought a reorganization to the staff. Palo Alto had done great things. I mean, they they continue to move forward. They're extremely progressive. Uh, and there just comes a time when you need new leadership. Yeah. And I think that, and I'm passionate about this, I think people stay in their positions too long. There comes a time when you have to move on. And it was my time. My husband, one morning he woke up and he said, I can't make this work anymore. He said, they've gotten everything out of me they can. He said, I'm not well. He had um, type 2 diabetes. He had irregular heartbeat. Um, he said, I'm not, I can't do it. He said, but I've left a good staff there. And I'm going to quit. I said, well, let's talk about this. He said, no, we're not going to talk about this. He said, uh, if you want to continue to work, you do that. And only my husband knew what it had done to me and how much time and energy it had taken. I said, well, I'm going to retire too, but I'll tell you what. You don't have to settle somewhere before I leave. Mm -hmm. So you tell me how long it's going to take you to find a place for us to live in because I don't think I can stay here after. I... So he said, give me two years. And that's what I did. I said, now don't ask me about a house 
find a place, build a house. When you got it done, I'll, I'll come. Now, I could say that. That sounds cavalier, but he had a double major in engineering and architecture. He went to have. And it was my time. It was time to move on. They said, oh, just stay. I said, no, I'm not going to stay. My marriage license says Roscoe Fleming, not City of Franklin. And he was really getting sick. So. But I think uh, it's that you're so wanting to cause, uh, create a change and help others that you're not thinking about what it appears to others. You're not others really concerned us, about that. Yeah. Others helped us. This is true. None of us would be yeah. where we are and Black if someone hadn't helped us. It's not a story that's told often, but somewhere, I can, I know I would not have been able to achieve what I did. If I hadn't had the help of others, it helped me prepare myself to be able to do it. This is true. You know, it's just... And you we, know, a lot of those people who helped us... Uh, were not necessarily black people. They were white That's people. That's right. Yeah. You see, they took, they stepped up to the plate and said, "This is a talented soul. Let me help them out." Bill, really, the city government. I mean, I just, I never would know or be able to do if it hadn't been for Bill. Yes. Bill still lives. He doesn't sign a rose. Does he? Okay. Right. Yeah, he's still there. Fantastic. He's still there. And he's probably a, a fabulous person. He is. He's he a just, wonderful, wonderful man. He's had some hard things happen to him in life. He's, but he, he, he was wonderful. He was really wonderful to me. Right. Well, I'm thank great, you. I'm grateful for him for giving you the opportunity. And I'm grateful for you for sharing your day, your life with me. I really well, appreciate Well, thank you, Kathy. And I wish you the best. Thank you, June for sharing your experiences as a city manager for one of the most sought-after communities in California. You left an indelible mark on the way the city of Palo Alto is run today. Thank you, June, for giving us your time and memories, and thank you for listening.